Good morning. morning. On this less than perfect day. And that's uh, good morning to those who are worshipping here at Fulton Physically this morning. And good morning to those who are worshipping us from here to New Zealand on live streaming. Hope you're there in New Zealand. Uh, I don't think there's anything to add to the notices except that coffee is being served after worship. And Holy Communion will be, will be celebrated in the course of our worship. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome again to our, uh, our church, the Reverend Jamie Hissack, who is the moderator of the United Reformed Church in West Yorkshire. Uh, Jamie's well known to, uh, to a lot of us, I think, in the, in the church, but for those of you uh, who don't, uh, and we're, I guess those of us who do are looking forward to him leading us in worship. It's a delight to have him with us again. We're committed as a church to saying at the beginning of worship a prayer uh, which is part of leading your church into growth uh, ministry. And we're praying for growth here at Paul Tune. And so I invite you to share in this uh, prayer for Paul Tune. If you're watching with us online, pray this prayer either for this church or for the church to which you normally belong. So let us say together, let's pray together. God of mission, who alone brings growth to your church, send your Holy Spirit to Portal Church to give vision to our planning, wisdom to our actions, joy to our worship, and power to our witness. Help our church to grow in numbers, in spiritual commitment to you, and in service to our local community. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you for your worship. It's lovely to be with you this morning, to be joining with you once again, and to be leading you in worship. I bring you the greetings of the Yorkshire United Reformed Church Synod. We are a family of churches, and it's always good to be reminded of those things that connect us one to another. Our call to worship. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. We join together in our opening hymn, King of Kings, Majesty, God of Heaven, living in me. Thank you. 
Well, before we come to our opening prayers, I've got a little quiz for you, okay? It's a nice way to start um, a Sunday morning. Um, It's a quiz with a theme, and the theme is first things, okay? It's all about first things. So let's start with one um, that anybody could answer, and the question is this, what is the first thing that you ate today? I'm sure you've all had something to eat today. What's the first thing? Anybody want to tell me, what's your first thing that you ate today? Any, any offers? What's the first thing you ate today? A piece of toast. Was it, with the, the f- and sausages, together, both at the same time. Okay, excellent. I bet nobody can beat a piece of toast and sausages. Okay, well done. Okay, so that's what everyone could do. Um, what else could we say? Can anybody name me the first Harry Potter book? Okay, there are lots of them, aren't they? What's the name of the very first Harry Potter book? Ooh. Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. I don't even got any Harry Potter fans. Okay. Can anybody tell me who is coming first in the Winter Olympics at the moment? Which nation has got the most medals? Norway. Well done. Well done. It's Norway. Is it 15, 16 medals and counting? Excellent. Doing a little bit better than us, but at least we've got two now, haven't we? So, uh, yeah, we haven't completely uh, embarrassed ourselves. Okay. Who was the first person to get to the top of Mount Everest? And? Okay. Uh, Sherpa Tensing as well. Okay. Um, do you know, an awful lot of these first questions, they're all about men, so we need a, need a, need a, a women one. Um, who was the first women, woman to win a Nobel Prize? Oh, you're good. You're really, really good, aren't you? You're absolutely on it. Okay, what is the first commandment? Love the Lord your God. First of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other God but me. Don't you always dread the Bible questions in any quiz? Okay, yes, you really should know that, shouldn't you? But what's the first commandment? Thou shalt have no other God than me. You see, I've got to read it as well, so don't, don't worry. Okay. Now then, we're getting to the point now. These are three questions that I want us to think about through the whole of this service. Who is the first person to teach you something about what it means to follow Jesus? Who was the first person to do that? Or one of the first people, because there might be many. Somebody said, me ma'am. Yeah, okay. Likely you had somebody that had a similar question. You don't have to answer that question now. We'll be exploring it. Okay. If you were to tell another person, what do you really believe? What's your creed? What do you really believe? What would be first on the list of things? Okay. What would be the first You don't have to answer, okay? Just think about it, okay? And here's a slightly different question. Again, if you were to share your faith with somebody else, what is the thing that you can speak of from first-hand experience? Something that you know yourself. What would be the thing that you could share from first-hand experience? I think you've done really well on my first quiz. Uh, you're, you're, you're first, first uh, in the list, so uh, well done. Um, but let's take that idea as we come to God in prayer. Let's pray. First things first. You are our great and gracious God. It is to you that we come in worship. We put you first. It is your redeeming love that calls us here. It is by your invitation that we draw near as your family. It is in your loving embrace that we know your saving love. First things first. 
First things first. To know you, we must first know Jesus. Jesus, who is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Jesus, who brings us the first fruits of the Spirit. First things first. Without you, we are nothing. Alone, we are like leaves blown around in the wind. We are in danger of going wrong at every turn. We cannot find our way home without your help. And so, first things first, we bring our prayer of confession for the wrong we have done and for the good that we had failed to do. And so, first things first, we want to begin again. We open our hearts to your forgiving love. We trust ourselves to your gracious mercy. We commit ourselves to live for you and for you alone. First things first. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's share together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Listen now to two readings from the New Testament. First of all, from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, and then from Luke's Gospel. First reading is from Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, 1 to 11. The Resurrection of Christ. And now I want to remind you, my brothers, of the good news which I preached to you, which you received, and on which your faith stands firm. That is the gospel, the message that I preached to you. You are saved by the gospel if you hold firmly to it unless it was for nothing that you believed. I passed unto you what I received, which is of the greatest importance, that Christ died for our sins, as written in the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised to life three days later, as written in the scriptures, that he appeared to Peter and then to all twelve apostles. Then he appeared to more than 500 of his followers at once, most of whom are still alive, although some have died. Then he appeared to James, and afterwards to all the apostles. Last of all, he appeared also to me, even though I am like someone whose birth was abnormal, for I am the least of all the apostles. I do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted God's church. But by God's grace, I am what I am, and the grace that he gave me was not without effect. On the contrary, I have worked harder than any of the other apostles, although it was not really my own doing, but God's grace working with me. So then, whether it came from me or from them, this is what we all preach, and this is what you believe. And from Luke, chapter 8, verses 22 to 25. Jesus calms a storm. One day, Jesus got into a boat with his disciples and said to them, Let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they started out. As they were sailing, Jesus fell asleep. 
Suddenly, a strong wind blew down on the lake, and the boat began to fill with water, so that they were all in great danger. The disciples went to Jesus and woke him up, saying, Master, Master, we are about to die. Jesus got up and gave an order to the wind, and the stormy water, but they died down, and there was a great calm. Then he said to the disciples, Where is your faith? But they were amazed and afraid, and said to one another, Who is this man? He gives orders to the winds and waves, and they obey him. Amen. And so now we listen to our next hymn, 449, if anyone's following in the hymn book. Lord of creation, to you be all praise. Do you remember my three questions? Who first taught you what it means to follow Jesus? Where did your story begin? If you were to give your creed, what do I really believe? What would be first on the list? 
And if you were called on to give an account of what your faith means to you today, what could you speak of from first-hand experience? First and foremost. That's the phrase that has particularly struck me. It was one, if not exactly in those words, certainly in the sentiment of those words, in the reading from 1 Corinthians, if you are listening, as Paul takes his congregation in Corinth back to first principles in all three of those ways. Paul, of course, has um, a fatherly concern for that Corinthian congregation. It was, of course, one of the congregations, one of the communities of early Christian disciples uh, that he had actually brought to birth and had nurtured in their first years. Luke tells us he was a whole 18 months working with that Corinthian church. By modern ministry standards, that, of course, is a very short posting uh, in a particular church, but in terms of Paul's ministry, that was quite a long time and sufficient time for him to have invested deeply in the life and in the ministry and the witness of that particular congregation. Now, Paul, of course, is some way distant from them. Um, There are all kinds of guesses as to where Paul was writing from, probably, I think, from Ephesus. And so he is addressing the congregation from a distance. He's heard news, and it's not all happy news. Um, Paul knows that congregation firsthand. He knows their enthusiasm for the gospel, and in particular for the gifts of the Spirit, and that ought also, of course, be a cause of rejoicing and a cause of strength. But what Paul also knows is that, sadly, within the life of the church, that very same enthusiasm is creating problems and tensions within the congregation because it's causing divisions and pride and the division into different parties. And so Paul is addressing this congregation that he loves deeply, has invested in deeply, but also has a deep concern. And it's in that context, with that fatherly uh, concern for this beloved congregation, that Paul takes them back to first principles. And within that long distance congrega- a conversation with the congregation, there is, of course, um, primarily a taking them back to where it all began. What are the first things that we can speak of, that Paul can speak of to these Corinthian Christians, where the story of faith began? And of course, this is a story that is barely 20 years old couple of decades old, and that's all. And it's an interesting question, isn't it? Where does our faith begin? How did the Christian faith begin? From Paul's perspective, where does the story start? And it's not always easy to answer that question. Think about how the four Gospels all start in different places. Mark, with the story of John the Baptist. Luke with John the Baptist's parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth. Matthew going back to Abraham and the family tree of Jesus. And John going back to the beginning of all things. In the beginning was the word. There are lots of answers to where does the story of faith begin. And I wonder if for the first apostles, the first disciples of Jesus who'd been with them, during his ministry, whether that story that we heard of from the Gospels of the calming of the storm might have been a moment anyway, when that journey of faith might have been felt to beginning, when they they find themselves asking that question, and who is this Jesus whom even the wind and the waves obey? There can be many answers to that question. But for Paul... Whenever he is writing to his Christian communities and whatever the context, there is always one moment that is the beginning of the story, and it is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's certainly true at this point in in Corinthians, as Paul brings the congregation back to first things first, first 
and foremost. Our manse is in Wakefield, uh, on the edge of, uh, of, of Wakefield. Um, pretty much wherever I go out of our house, um, there's one landmark that I can always see. It's the Emily Moore transmitter. Have you ever been up that part of the country? And I can be on the other side of Yorkshire. I can be over in Huddersfield. I can be over that side. What's the one landmark I can see? The Emily Moore. Actually, there's two of them at the moment, aren't there? There's the, uh, the main one and the, the additional one. If I'm uh, a little bit further north, a little bit further, not quite as far south as Sheffield, but in so many places, that landmark stands there and you can orientate yourself uh, by it. For Paul, the death and resurrection of Jesus is always that landmark in this vast uh, landscape of faith that he's helping to navigate those early Christians through. It is the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's where it began. This is a, a year of anniversaries for us, is it not? We have, of course, the, the Queen's Platinum uh, anniversary. Uh, we have an anniversary of the United Reformed Church. We are 50 years old this year, and I know that also coincides for you with a 10th year anniversary for your journey as a local ecumenical partnership. And at various points on that journey... Uh, it's been my privilege to have shared something of it with you. Anniversaries are times, aren't they, inevitably, to think back, and where can we say that this story began? And yes, for the URC, you might say it began in 1972, but many decades before that, conversations about what it might mean um, to bring uh, different denominations together in this country. Here in Selby, Although there was a, a point uh, in, in the diary when this LEP was formed, uh, lots of conversations that laid the ground for that. And to go back to that, that, that journey that was being made then, I hope is still being made now, that sense of, and what does it mean to pursue the unity of the church, to discover what it means to be one in Christ, and to actually put that at the focus and let other things take second place. Surely that was part of that journey, that going back to where it began for us, whether uh, as a United Reformed Church denomination or, or for you as an LEP. And there's something important of being refocused on that journey. What does it mean to express the unity of the body of Christ, the oneness of the body of Christ, and how that might inspire our journey today? So that's the first way in which Paul is calling the Corinthians back to first things first. Where did this story begin? What were the first things of which we can speak? But Paul is also talking about, and what is the most, the first thing to say? And again, it takes us back to the cross. It takes us back to what it means to be a community centered around the death of and resurrection of Jesus, and what that means in terms of what God is doing in reconciling the world to, to himself. And although Paul will often take his, his, uh, his, his uh, uh, Christian brothers and sisters back to a first moment, he also brings them back to that thing which is first and foremost in terms of what we believe, that in that event, in that event, is the most important thing we need to know. And it is quite remarkable when you think about it, all of the other things that Paul could have said about living the life of Christ, about um, theological concepts that might be primary, but no, it is taking them back to the reconciling work of Jesus Christ in the cross. And so I ask the question, if we were to express our faith today, what would be first on the list? I had an argument with one of my fellow moderators this week. It, no, it wasn't an argument. It was a friendly chat. Uh, and it, and it was actually a really interesting one. And we were talking, as we sometimes do, about what the challenge for the church is now. What is the challenge for the local church? And I found myself saying, we, we were sort of talking about, on the one hand, mission, and on the other hand, discipleship. 
to words that I think, I hope uh, I speak for you, are words that excite us, that attract us within the life of the church if we want to get back to first principles. These are things that we ought to be focused on, mission and discipleship. And although they overlap, discipleship is about how we resource one another within the life of faith. And mission is when we turn that outwards in a street-facing, world-facing way. I found myself saying, uh, and we do this from time to time, don't we? One of the challenges for the church is, although we find both of those words attractive, we often find ourselves drawn more to discipleship. because It's more comfortable. It's about the life that we enjoy within the life of the church. We find it much harder to face out to the world. And my colleague was saying, oh, no, 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 it's the other way around. The problem, the challenge for the church is that we love doing mission, particularly if it's at a, dis- a long distance. But the problem is when we get out there into the world, we don't really know who we are as, as children of, of God or followers of Jesus because we haven't uh, uh, built up our faith enough. We didn't come to blows, you'd be glad to say. And the, the truth is, of course, that both of those challenges are absolutely true. And that we will never be the people that God calls us to be in Jesus unless we hold those together. If we are people doing mission out the world without knowing what our own faith is, we will not get very far. If we uh, are only ever interested in, 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 in the comfort of a life within the fellowship and never are inspired to share that with the world outside there, well, it will actually show that our faith is not where it should be, that both of those things stand together. But here's the point. They stand together because we are seeking to be people of Christ, people of Jesus. And that is what both feeds us and which sends us out. And those two things stand together. So what are the first things, what are the priorities in um, who we seek to be? And then the final thing is, and what can we speak of from first-hand testimony? In those little conversations we have, in those little moments that open for us uh, in the life of our our work or our leisure or even in, in, in the life of the church as we meet those who maybe are, are uh, around in our, our premises. What are the things from which we can speak firsthand? During my ministry, if I reflect back, I spent quite a lot of time in different ways um, making posters to advertise things uh, that will go on the wall. Or maybe composing nicely worded things which will go out there to, to, to advertise things or whatever it might be. And I'd like to think that all that time was not completely wasted. Maybe somebody somewhere has seen one of my posters and thought, oh, that's worth going to. But of course, what I know in my heart is that actually the thing that makes the most difference is that first-hand testimony, that being able to speak from what is in your heart, what matters to you, and what you can actually show in the way in which we live. And in that Lysig agenda, leading your church into growth, and and how wonderful to see how it's uh, helped you as a congregation, how wonderful as I go around the Synod, I find many different congregations of different complexions of of theological background equally finding uh, that really helpful. It is about how um, the people we are the way in which we live, the way in which we worship, can actually show in and of itself from our first-hand experience that this life in Christ really matters to us. One of the things I've been saying often uh, around the Synod and through the Synod uh, recently is that I do think that there is a, something very particular about the moment we find ourselves in as churches. And part of that is for us as United Reformed Church that we are in an anniversary year. And that does raise questions, what do we have to celebrate? What is it that we should be doing? On the other hand, we are on that journey out of uh, an unprecedented period in the life of the world, never mind just a church, in that we've experienced a pandemic, we've had to do things differently, we've proved that we can do things differently, And we ought to be asking ourselves serious questions. And so what next? 
What does this mean for the life of the church now? And putting those two things together, it has seemed to me that this is a moment when we do need to be taken back to first principles. First and foremost, what really matters to us? What matters to us in terms of where our journey began and the journey that we are still making? What really matters to us in terms of our, uh, who we are as disciples of Jesus centered around the, the death and resurrection of Jesus, the reconciling work of God? And what does it mean to be people who can speak from first hand, from first hand experience of what it means to be followers of Jesus? So those are my challenges for you and indeed for the wider synod. How do we make those first and foremost questions count in this moment of opportunity and show ourselves people centered on Jesus crucified and risen? We're going to prepare now for our communion meal, and the hymn is, Lord Jesus Christ, you have come to us. have laid before us, not because of what we have brought, the bread, the wine, the offering of our money, and all that that represents of the offering of our time and talents. No, this is a table of riches, because these are symbols of your grace, poured out to us and through us in the name of Jesus Christ, 
And so we give you thanks in his name. Amen. And so we celebrate this joyful feast. People will come from east and west and north and south and sit at table in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is like this, Jesus said. And he showed them a seed. Let God's life grow new in you, he said. The kingdom of heaven is like this, Jesus said, and he showed them a child. Become like her, he said, and you will enter God's house. The kingdom of heaven is like this, Jesus said, and he showed them a broken loaf. I am broken for you, he said. Take it and remember. The kingdom of heaven is like this, Jesus said, and he showed them blood red wine. Drink this, he said, for it binds you to God in a new way. The kingdom of heaven is like this, Jesus said, as he washed their feet. So may it be among you, he said, as he knelt. Let's come to God with our prayer of thanksgiving. Let's pray. Who would have thought, if ever we could have been there, that in the first stirrings of creation, when matter, energy, and even time itself began to show their separate qualities, who would have thought that from such seeds your kingdom would grow? But alleluia, it did. Thanks be to you, our Father in heaven. Who would have thought, though few were there to see, that in the figure of a rejected man, a traveling preacher and wonder worker, now hung helpless on a cross, nailed there by the taunts of a disillusioned mob, who would have thought that from such a one, your kingdom would grow. But alleluia, it did. Thanks to you, our Saviour Christ. Who would have thought, though they were nobodies of the world, that in the hearts of a dozen or so men and women, the conviction that they had been touched by the Spirit could so open their minds and hearts to proclaim the gospel that the world would be turned upside down. Who would have thought that in such a field your kingdom could grow? But alleluia, it did. Thanks be to you, Spirit and source of life. And who would think that we, humble servants of you, our God, partakers of this common bread and wine, confessing our unworthiness and surrendering all to Christ, could be seeds of the kingdom too. But alleluia. By your spirit we can be, we are and we shall be. And so thanks to be to you, our one God. And so let us proclaim the mystery at the heart of our faith. I invite you to say these three lines after me. Christ has died. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ will come again. So the bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. Let us take, let us eat. It is the body of Christ given for us. We do this in remembrance of him.
and we'll eat together when we've all been served. And so the cup of blessing which we bless is a sharing in the communion of the blood of Christ. Let us take it. Let us drink it. It is the new covenant in the blood of Christ shed for us as for all for the forgiveness of sins. And again, we will drink when all have been served.
the wine of the kingdom in Christ Jesus. And so shall we pray. Before we leave this table, the God whom we know in Jesus Christ, having feasted on the riches of your grace, let us bring our prayer, <coughs> first of all, for the world. Our prayer for peace with justice holding before you in particular our concern for what's happening on the border between Russia and Ukraine at this time, for the potential for war, but the hope for peace. And all around the world where injustice and a conflict mar the lives of too many of your children. Our prayer for peace with justice. And our prayer for the life of the church, for faith with action, a faith lived out in Jesus-shaped, loving and giving. For this congregation, for our sister congregations, for all those with whom we share our faith. Our prayer for faith with action. And for the circles of of love, of family and friends of which we are a part. We pray for love with compassion. As we seek to support one another through times of tears and laughter. As we are there for one another in times of silence as well as speaking. As we seek to bring that healing touch to broken lives. We pray for love with compassion. And all this in the name of Jesus Christ, who shows us the immeasurable length and height and breadth of that love that you have for us, for all your children, and for all your world. And so in his name we pray. Amen. We come to our closing hymn, I Know That My Redeemer Lives.
so now may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with us, all those we love, and all for whom we pray, this day and forevermore.